Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Praise God, our Father's Word. We continue recapping the book of Revelation and discussing the most asked questions on or about the book of Revelation. I feel it's good that we do this while the book is still fresh in your mind, whereby you can recall the scriptures and to help you better understand how to teach the book of Revelation or share it with others. We had completed uh, a, probably the most asked question about chapter 7, and that happens to be, when, when is it going to happen? And the answer, of course, was when everyone's sealed that God intends to be sealed. In other words, God's elect must have the truth in their mind as to the events, the chronological order of events that shall transpire, that consummate the end of this age. Uh, chapter 8 gives you the seventh seal, which basically is to intuitively understand most of the seals as they are given in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. Not most, all are given. And uh, that's a study we need not go into. But in that eighth chapter, Christ would have you know and understand that he observed Satan as a star, old wormwood, fall on this earth. And this is a takeoff from Luke chapter 10, verse 18, where Christ there perceives and foretells, even in Luke 10, 18, of these events. Now, let's come to, we ask a word of wisdom from our Father, and let's get right into our first question of this day. How long shall Antichrist reign on earth. Now you are told in the book of Daniel as well as many other places that there would be one reckoned unto a week, which means seven periods of times, which means seven years. And in the middle of that week, which is to say three and a half days or three and a half years basically, that as it is written, we're quoting now from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that in the middle of that week, the uh, daily covenant and so on and so forth, and that the, the um, oppressor, the, uh, the desolator, as he is called in the Hebrew, would come on his wings, being an individual, an entity, which is to say, instead of Christ or the son of perdition, which is to say Satan, the devil, the old dragon, by whatever name you wish to call him, that he would appear on earth. Okay, your answer, of course, to the question, how long shall he reign? For we were told in Mark chapter 13 that that time was shortened for the elect's sake or there else there would be no flesh saved. I mean, that's how, that's how convincing that Satan will be when he is on earth as Antichrist. It's going to be extremely convincing that even those that have studied and learned beforehand, when they see his brilliance, his power over this earth to bring peace, exactly opposite of what most people think Satan would do if he were on earth, when he appears to be a savior, acts like a savior, talks like a savior, and in fact is the false or spurious savior, the son of perdition. God was good enough to us that he, in the ninth chapter of Revelations, is where you find the period of time that Antichrist shall actually reign. You're, you're as in all cases, the Old Testament is a first witness to the second witness, which is to say the New Testament. The book of Joel, on which those on Pentecost Day were giving you an example of that day, 
That's why Peter would say on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2 that this is that. All right, that's, that means this is that. This is exactly what Joel the prophet was speaking of when this tongue uh, was spoken that every language in the world could hear clearly and understand when they were delivered up. The locust army. Now in Revelation chapter 9 we see the pit which is simply a way of saying this place of degradation or you might say Satan's state compared to God in heaven which is to say above. He is lower. He's the pit. Though um, de facto he is even in heaven to be cast out on this earth. But still when the pit is open, which means the pit of the events of the last day, Satan is released along with his locust army that was written of in Joel. They're not literally locusts, they're simply the Kenites that Satan's children plus the fallen angels that will come with him. But God, for our benefit and for our protection, gives us this special guarantee. That in, and it is written in the fourth verse that he could neither, that he could not hurt anything of nature, but he could only bother those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. While he's here, we'll get to that. I'll still get to that question, how long, in just a moment. And to them it was given, in verse 5, that they should not kill them, but that they should torment that they should be tormented five months. Now this term, five months then, that's the answer to the question. For it continues then to explain the army and the, their power, such as they could sting as scorpions, which is a figure of speech saying they would melt the backbone and every person that would listen to them as far as starch to stand against them. And the fifth five months again would be repeated in this chapter, but the actual the actual title is given in verse eleven. And they have a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, which is to say Lucifer, the bright and morning star. I think everyone knows who the angel is of the bottomless pit. And which, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is a bad don. That means destruction. And that is Satan's name, the destroyer. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, which is to say uh, perdition, he that has been promised to perish. And we see then that Antichrist will literally reign five months. Now, I would issue a word of caution, for I feel in as much as a 10-day period is, I'll just turn there real quickly, in um, Revelation chapter 2, we read concerning the church of Smyrna, one of those two churches that is accurate, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, in other words, that you'll be a witness, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. So you see, and uh, I still think he will reign for a five-month period, but I think in the delivering up, no one will have over ten days tribulation. That is to say, in the process of the delivering. I caution you, and... Part of the deception is, as one is in the flesh, is always to fear pain. And that's natural. The central nervous system demands that you fear pain or dread pain. And that is one of the tricks that Satan uses for, in actuality, he's not coming as a devil that with a pitchfork or needles 
or anything that would bring pain to a flesh body. Quite the opposite. And my friend, this is the deception, and it's something you must never let slide from your mind or you're going to have doubts even yourself. He's coming to be the uh, to present himself as the answer to every prayer. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, prosperity for everyone, no problems, cancellation of all debts, prosperity and plenty everywhere, and a religious leader that will condemn all evil seemingly. For in fact, he will be creating the greatest evil of all. He'll be playing God. And to turn the hearts of the children away from the true father to the false father, Satan, is blasphemy and is, a, and is an abomination to the highest degree. You can't do anything that is more of a sin than to play God or play Savior which is exactly what he's coming to do for this nine-month period, for this five-month period, correction. The ninth chapter of Revelation is where you have the answer, how long shall Antichrist rule on earth? That is one of the questions that is most often asked about the book of Revelation. Now, probably the next uh, most asked question we are given in the 10th chapter, he that has uh, the power to release the thunders. I'm not going to say that one of the most often asked questions are in that chapter because it isn't. There's not a most often question there, though there is some interesting information. But then comes that exciting 11th chapter, which is the chapter concerning the two witnesses. And one of the most often ask questions not only from the book of Revelations but from any believer is who are the two witnesses? Now, I can tell you no one knows who those two witnesses are. But we can educate ourselves from the word of God whereby we, we know at least we can put brackets on it. We are told again from the Old Testament, we are given the first testimony concerning the two witnesses and we find that in Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah is a fantastic book concerning end time prophecy. You'll remember I quoted Zechariah in the last lecture. The fact that both the first and the second advent were mentioned in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 being the first advent, 10 the second. The 14th chapter of the book of Zechariah tells you in detail what shall happen the day Christ sets foot on the Mount of Olives and splits it asunder, preparing a way from Jerusalem, and even goes into detail on the changing, though it's rather a harsh description of the flesh melting like wax, for you put it off and put on the spiritual body. A little frightening to some when they don't realize the love of our Father. But we're told in that fourth chapter of Zechariah, and I'm going to give it to you in the Hebrew, my two sons of the oil. Why two sons of the oil? Because there's no gender in this now. There is nothing to say that one or both of the two witnesses would not be female. I know it may upset some for me to say that, but my documentation, quite frankly, is from the book of Joel and Pentecost Day, Acts 2, that sons and daughters shall play a part in this fantastic, wonderful closing of this earth age. Therefore, you cannot eliminate them because of that fact. Uh, from uh, exclusion and thoughts of being one of the two witnesses. But these sons of the, of the oil receive all their, who, regardless of who the two witnesses are, they receive total power from Almighty God for the oil 
which is the Holy Spirit, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, moves without the aid of any man, but by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God controls their minds and so forth. There is a very strong argument that the two witnesses could be Elijah and could be Enoch, who were both translated, they did not die in the flesh, but were translated into heaven, picked up as it is described in Elijah's case, not necessarily Enoch's, but in Elijah's case, in a whirling circular vehicle that took him up. If you're not familiar with that, I have a work called Horses of the Bible. You better learn what those horses are from the Hebrew tongue to understand. But, and the, many of the things that Elijah accomplished even in his ministry when he was on earth, such as rain, no rain, and so forth, is stipulated in this 11th chapter concerning the two witnesses. So, in a sense, at least he was a type. Now, there is one thing, though, that you must always take into consideration, for it is written in this 11th chapter, and when they shall have finished their testimony, that's to say the two witnesses, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, that's Satan himself, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So, we know that the case against transformed bodies grows a little slim here, for there is no way that Satan can kill a soul, all right? The question could be open, well, how can we say that they are totally in spiritual bodies? Well, that's something we human beings cannot answer in completeness. But as time goes by, we might uh, think there is also the promise in the last verses of Malachi that Elijah would return, but it was not to accomplish this. Elijah was to return to teach, which is to say to turn the hearts of the children, that's the minds, by teaching the Word of God back to the true Father and would drive some to the false father. Why? The, her, the truth. The truth of God's teaching is quite contrary to the traditions of men. But inasmuch as they must die physically in their flesh bodies and their dead bodies, um, as, in, as in the ninth verse, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. In other words, it's got to be somebody that can shed blood from this dead body. And... Uh, it leaves no doubt as to the location. So, who are the two witnesses? Will it be someone supernatural? I rather doubt it. In my own opinion, it would be somebody on this earth today, but it, and then some might say, but they have supernatural power. Supernatural power only works through them. As Zechariah chapter 4, with the direction at the, and at the hand of Zerubbabel, he that built, if you would, the many-membered temple, understand, follow me, by that plumb line, these two sons of oil would work from that to teach and to allow the Holy Spirit to feed even the seven eyes that were the witness of God, meaning the 7,000 elect and the kings and queens of the ethnos by the thousand would hear the truth through that, through those efforts. So, what is the answer to who, the, who are the two witnesses? No one knows. No one knows. 
but it can be definitely answered where the power comes from, from Almighty God, regardless of who the two witnesses are. Okay, now let's go on to the next question. I think that answers that. And there are times you must simply say, man cannot know. And in the two witnesses case, that's exactly what it is. And uh, let's see, I've got that question. Let's see, just show me, where is Satan now? Okay, let me pick up where I'm at here on these questions. It would seem, how long shall Satan reign? How long shall Antichrist reign on earth? All right, now I'm back in line here. Who are the two witnesses? Where is Satan now? Well, we would move on to the 12th chapter to pick that up. You will remember that he walked to and fro in Job's time. He was in the Garden of Eden, that old serpent, which is called the devil. But when he tempted Christ in the wilderness that 40 days, Christ said, get behind me. And that's where Satan is to this day. He is not afforded, though his evil spirit can walk this earth. Satan himself, de facto, as that angel of light, cannot walk this earth until Michael cast him out of paradise, heaven, place of holding, whatever you want to call it. And your documentation for that is chapter 12 in the book of Revelation, verse 7. It will answer your question as to where Satan is now. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old, in case you don't know who the dragon is, then God is very kind to you. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Cast out of heaven. To be cast out of somewhere, you've got to be there. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, whatever name you want to call him by, but one entity, which deceiveth the whole world, if you let him. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, many feel this has already come to pass, and how, 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 one could set themselves up to be deceived, to think that the little demonics and evil spirits that are present now, this cannot happen until the time of the sixth trump, where the sixth trump sounds. It has not sounded. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Do you know where he's at right now? He's still in heaven. Do you know what he's doing? Accusing you. If you claim to be one of God's elect and feel you are and, and you know, Every time you mess up, there Satan is. Aha, uh -huh, God, look at your little pretty there. Look at your little child. Man, I can take them just like that, Satan tells God. That offends our father because he wants to be proud of his children. And then in the 12th verse, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, because of the question last, uh, next to last, you should know it hasn't happened yet. For what, what does it mean he's only going to have a short time? You just read it in the ninth chapter, five months. Has that five months happened? Of course not. Because there will be a total, complete change as you learn from the 13th chapter and will be one of the questions following that 
that five months is drawn out in detail in chapter 13. So, the question, where is Satan now? He's in heaven. How do we know that? De facto, only his evil spirit. Always remember this as a rule of thumb when you're studying God's word. For every negative, there is a positive, and for every positive, there is a negative. God sees to that, for it is in the name of fairness. And that may be a little hard to grasp at first, but hear me out. We are in a time of testing, that is to say, whether one will choose God or Satan. This, the reward for succeeding and choosing God is eternal life, and to choose Satan is death. And for one that is easily deceived, or that is easy to mess up, then heaven is not would not be a fit place if that person were left or should remain through that period of time. Do not get yourself on a guilt trip when I make that statement because of your flesh body because we will not be in flesh bodies through the millennium or at that time. The little things that your flesh craves and, and forms habits over will not be a habit there for you will not be in the flesh. And it will be very simple to follow and love our Father and to be good children. So Satan definitely, unequivocally, is in heaven, but his opposite of the Holy Spirit, which is to say I'll simply call it Satan's spirit. If the Holy Spirit is allowed to affluence this earth, when one would ask him, then also as well, Satan, if anything, has a little more power in as much as he is the prince of darkness, and this is the time of darkness. And he tempts people, if they're worthy. And what makes someone worthy to Satan if they're one of God's elect? He has the others eating out of his hand because they are biblically illiterate. But he will challenge one of God's elect and never fall into his trap when things, when someone first learns truth, many things begin to happen. And all you got to do, this is where faith, real faith comes in. All you have to do is simply say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I order anything negative or satanic out of my life and my path and I ask Christ to put a wall around me, my family, my property, and Satan, don't you dare cross it in the name of Yeshua Messiah. In other words, you don't have to put up with it. You're in control, as Luke chapter 10, verse 18 so declares, and don't you ever forget it. So, again, and then we'll close out that particular question. Where is Satan? He's in heaven. His evil spirit, it's on earth. But you have the Holy Spirit, which gives you the victory over it. He will be cast to this earth for a, for a short period, as the 12th chapter so stipulates. And, um, and will um, have that five-month period. And don't worry, we'll all know when it is because it will be boom from one end of the country to the other, world to the other, as it is written in Mark 13. When they say, is he in, he's in the desert or he's here, believe it not, don't go. As long as you're in a flesh body, the true Christ has not returned. Okay, well, let's go on to another question. Following that question, who are the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13? And that is a good question. <coughs> Excuse me. That is a very good question because it's paramount that you understand that. God deals in symbology as we learned in the first part of this lecture concerning the, the stars and the candlesticks being angels in the churches. 
the two beasts are simply to symbolize, to symbolize systems, one political and one religious. And it is absolutely necessary that you understand that, that this is this seven head, ten horn thing is simply tentacles leading from a political system known as and called one worldism. You will be asked this because simply from the, from the day of a, a child's bearing up beast, the big beast, the dragon, you know, and they visualize these things. And this in itself, through our Father's efforts in putting the Word, even the revelation, that that reveals, gives you a picture of the one world system and its tentacles of power, how it comes to power. But the second beast of Revelation chapter 11, you must, as an instructor or someone that shares the Word of God, never forget that 11th verse. Never forget it. For it describes the second beast to a fullness for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And it reads, And I beheld another beast, that's the second, coming up out of the earth. This, this is symbolism again. Lower in a snake's belly, the angel of the bottomless pit, though he is in heaven, his moral stature is in the nether world, low as low can get. It is a figure of speech. Now do not let that deceive you. Coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. In other words, he looked like the Lamb of God. He had two horns, meaning power like the Lamb of God. Do you understand? Let me say it a little different. He looked like Jesus. Appeared to be Jesus. Horns always sim symbolize power. He had the power of Christ, uh, seemingly. And he spake as a dragon. Why? He was the dragon. He is the Antichrist. He is the son of perdition. He is that entity that shall deceive the world simply because he takes the role of the Lamb of God, Savior of the world, so gentle, so loving, so tender, the Lamb of God, he that gives all, shows all, and loves all, that will allow him. It will be a time, my friend, of winning souls but the trouble is, it's winning souls for Satan. So you must be very careful. The plan of salvation that our Father has brought forth is so very simple. And these most often asked questions of the book of Revelation will help you take the overall plan of God and weave it together in such a way that perhaps you can explain to people the love of their Father and what's about to happen. We'll pick it up in our next question in case you want to look ahead to it. Most ask will be blood up to the horse's bridles. Explain, please. All right. We'll pick that up in the next lecture and then we will conclude within the next lecture these most often asked questions. I hope you're enjoying them. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, please. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. 
Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. If you wish to pay your own toll, Area code 501-787-6026. Those of you that listen by short wave, your announcer will give you our mailing address at the end of the hour. It's so good to hear from you all around this world. And we thank our Father for the privilege and the right to take His truth to the children. If you have a prayer request, take it straight to Him. He's listening to you wherever you are around this globe. He loves you. Let him hear from you. Tell him you love and appreciate him. Father, we ask that wherever these might be and here, that you lead, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's get into some questions here. And, you know, it might surprise, but... Um, it is good for you to grow familiar with questions asked whereby you can answer and you present yourself a great deal better to your friends or to those that you care about that you do plant seeds to. Gertrude from California, explain a widow and her pleasure is dead while she lives. So I'll, uh, dear Gertrude, uh, I know exactly where you're coming from. You probably have met a gentleman that you want to remarry, and there is nothing wrong with a widow. Um, after her husband has passed away, that most of the vows say as long as you both shall live or as, um, and so forth. So, you are free. Once you repent of all sins to remarry, I would give only one word of caution. And that is that many times um, a new, um, certain uh, policies, grants, retirements, and so forth depend on marriage, so you might should check into that. Barbara from Tennessee. You talk a lot about the Kenites and the Midianites. Is there a connection? In the Strongs, when you look up Midianite, it says, see Kenite also. What is the difference? Well, there is a great, great deal of difference between the two people. The Kenites being a Hebrew word that simply means the sons of Cain. The Midianites were children of Medan, which you will find in the book of Genesis, were the offspring of Abraham with his second wife, Keturah. The reason the Strongs are most, most scholars, unfortunately in commentaries, will throw you because... One very important Midianite, he was a Midianite priest, his name was Jethro, lived in the land of the Kenites. And it was Moses' father-in-law. And because he was so prominent, many people th feel there is a connection. But let's say myself, I'm Irish. But because I live in Arkansas, I'm an Arkansan. But there is no connection whatsoever uh, between the race called Irish and a people called Arkansans. There's a lot of everything there. All right, you got it? I hope that helps you. Kendra from California. What do you mean by plant a seed? Well, it is a, it is a takeoff from the teaching Christ did concerning the sower the broadcasting of seed, which means truth. The seed was the Word. So you plant the Word in people's minds or at a time that it helps. So we use that uh, figure of speech. Incidentally, you might take a lesson from that, all of you, that sometimes when we use a figure of speech such as you that plant seed uh, to a new ear that was not familiar with the parable of the sower and Many other things wouldn't know what you're talking about, which in this case, you see what I'm saying. 
it gives us probably a, the, the um, a surety that we need to understand figures of speech as they were used in, excuse me, both the Old and the New Testament. Okay, Michael from California. In Revelation, it says if you take drugs, you are going to hell. And what if you have to be on medication? Now listen, there's no connection between the two, okay? And let me say it in this. I probably threw some people then by using the word in the Greek, sorcerer. All I said is our word pharmacist comes from the Greek word used for sorcerer, which has to do with drugs. Just because a person uses drugs, especially prescribed drugs, does not mean or indicate in any fashion that someone's going to hell. And always remember this, there's repentance anyway. Okay, Don from California. I've been studying Revelation with you, but still don't understand how nobody will be harmed. In Mark 13, it says you must be on uh, guard because you will be handed over to councils and uh, flogged and so forth. Well, uh, it... Uh, you better take it in a spiritual sense. Let me, let me tell you something, Don. He's coming, Antichrist is coming to play Jesus. And if he starts beating people, he's not going to make a very good uh, Jesus. People would recognize him as a fake instantly. So to be, he is called death. His name is death. He is the destroyer. And to be delivered up to death is to be delivered up to Satan. And quite frankly, if you are not, if you have not fixed in your mind what it is that you are to do when you're delivered up uh, before him, talk about a brow beating. Talk about a deception. Talk about being uh, harmed mentally. If one has not fixed in their mind that they are not to premeditate, but to lean totally upon Jesus at that moment, at that time, when they are delivered up, they're going to be in great trouble. So your question is a good question. But read again in Luke 21 where it covers this same subject from a little side profile. And God states to you, they cannot harm one hair on your head. And furthermore, God instructs Satan in that ninth chapter we covered in this lecture. You cannot touch those but those only that have not the seal of God in their forehead. When Satan messes up and finally touches two of them that do have that seal in their forehead, which is to say the two witnesses, he seals his, he signs his death warrant because it's all over in three days after that happens. Okay, Cliff from Florida. Is the deadly wound going on now in Russia? Well, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to say that um, the deadly wound is happening there. But you're a watchman. You keep watching. It could ultimately lead to that. There are some exciting things happening there. And the in Maryland from Indiana, I think I'll let my question concerning the hair on their head and so forth. Uh, answer your question. In, in Revelation chapter 20 where it speaks of those beheaded, basically that was done to the first. James was, uh, some say, boiled in oil. Uh, Peter crucified upside down and so on it goes. We, you know, we hear of those things. Uh, Yvonne from California. Why does the church down you when you want to remarry after a divorce? Well, some of them would, but know this, Christ's blood on the cross has the power to forgive, wash away 
all sins in relationship to man's um, domestic life. And I, and I say that because of the unforgivable, which is a spiritual thing, not marriage or divorce. That you are clean and fresh when you, from the heart, repent. I just, uh, Yvonne, I did a work called Divorce, a tape titled Divorce. I would highly recommend that you acquire it. Sandra from California. Will the angel of light transform himself to look like Jesus? Will he show himself to individuals or to groups? To both. The angel of light, Sandra, that I'm sure you're speaking of would be 2 Thessalonians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where Satan himself comes disguised. That's what the word really is in the Greek disguised as an angel of light. Yeah, he's going to show himself to the world. He's a show-off, period. He's a showman, a play actor, and he loves it. Uh, Kara, or Carl from Texas. Revelation 22, 2. Were these fruits gifts, or are they of the 12 tribes? No, they're, they're of the tree of life, and they are for the 12 tribes as well as all other people. Just what kind of fruit are these? Well, it is the fruits of Christ's labor and teaching that he passes on for the salve of our mind to have total contentment and happiness for the eternity. Uh, no boredom, nothing. You must realize that we are no longer in the flesh at that time, and it is spiritual. Barbara from Wisconsin, since I... Now study this message, do I need to be baptized again? No, not for that reason. There is only one Christ, and when you're baptized in and to Him, that's it. Nettie from California, Genesis 6-4. Please expound on the Nephilim. That's, they are the fallen angels that Satan will have cast out of heaven with him. They, were, they left heaven at one time before, and um, so uh, they shall return. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 24 when he was asked, what's it going to be like at the end of the world? And he stated, just like it was in the days of Noah, they're going to be again eating and drinking and giving and taking in marriage. Who were they taking in marriage? The fallen angels. It was for this reason that Paul said a woman should cover her head because of the angels with Christ, for they're coming back. Uh, Bill from California, Revelation 22:15. Does life go on during the millennium just as it is now? Uh, I'm not sure, Bill, why you would choose 22:15, for it is chapter 20 that has to do with the millennium. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to answer your question concerning the millennium. No, it will not go on as it does now for the very last thing that happens in this earth age before we move into the millennium is a total change of bodies. There will be no more flesh bodies in the millennium. So naturally, that in itself will create quite a change. But the earth itself shall not be rejuvenated until the end of the millennium but we will all be in spiritual bodies. Beverly from D.C., tithing. Do I tithe off of the top or after taxes? You tithe on what you receive. Shirley, from, uh, let me better explain that. Tithing is a very personal thing. You do not hear me mention that or money a great deal unless I'm teaching chapter by chapter and line by line. I am not a beggar. And if I speak too much on tithing, then I would be um, guilty, maybe, of being a beggar like some other ministries that you see and hear. The original tithing was both for, for the Levitical priesthood, was for the government and for the priesthood. So it is right to tithe on what you have after government taxes. You are perfectly legal and in right spiritually to pay tithe only on that that you receive after taxes. 
Uh, Shirley from California, if angels have no sex, then how could they have come down and took the daughters of Adam and had children? Whoa, Shirley. Adam was made in the image of God and the angel, and he was very male, very masculine. The angel bodies of this earth age were male. Were they in the first earth age? I doubt it. Will they be in the third? No. But the angels even of heaven are male because Adam was made in their image and they were able to practice the part of male. You must always remember, surely, angels' food was manna and it even sustains this flesh body. They are exactly alike, little different substance. That's the only difference between an angelic body and a flesh body. Marge from California, when Jesus went to heaven, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. What, excuse me, what was he talking about if, as you say, heaven will be on earth? Well, you're, you're quoting from John chapter 14, where he said, I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. There are many mansions. The word mansions in the Greek means resting places. And what comes down with him when he returns? New Jerusalem, the whole city, with all those resting places. And that's what he's prepared. Alva, and it will be on earth. And it is restful with him, even in heaven now. Wherever he is, that's where heaven is. Our Father, that is. Alvin from North Carolina. Don't you think the mark will be external also? Absolutely not. Now, if you were to ask that, will we be able to discern spiritually from the external appearance of the face, such as countenance, I would say yes. But as far as a mark is concerned, no. There will be no visible brand and our mark. It is in the forehead, which is to say their brains are marked with ignorance. That's exactly what the mark of the beast is, is for someone to have an, a biblically illiterate brain whereby they will be deceived when Satan walks on this earth. It's that simple, no big deal. Satan is smarter than to say, I'm going to line everybody up and put a tattoo on them and they're my children. No, he wants them smiling and looking exactly as Jesus would want them to look. He's a fake. Rufus from Indiana. I see you recommend the Companion Bible, but what type do you use on the show? I use a standard King James because many people that tune in would not accept teaching from anything but a standard King James, but I would say at the same time, a Companion Bible is a standard King James. All right? Uh, do I reference the Companion Bible? Sure I do. That, well, along with the manuscripts, it's a great study tool. When I prepare, I don't study on this program. I always research at least a minimum of a couple, three, four hours of meditation and study time combined before I sit before you for one solid hour uh, teaching His Word. Okay, Roy from Mississippi. Up till the point that Christ was crucified, did the dead stay in the grave? I heard you say that Christ went to the imprisoned and taught them, so were they in the grave? No, they were not. To be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord. They were all in paradise. But until Christ paid the price, uh, well, let's take David himself. He was a murderer. And he had to stay on the wrong side of the gulf until Christ forgave him, all right? Um, and no man should judge another man, but I use that as, as a prime example because it is mentioned in the second chapter of Acts as well concerning David when Christ was his son, yet um, so forth. You understand. Okay, Joseph from Canada. You say Satan has the same political system as before. Does Revelation 12 and Revelation 13 back this up or... Are there other references? Yes, Revelation 12 and 13 back this up. 12 gives you his power before. 
Revelation 13 gives you what he will use again. There, the book of Daniel backs it up to the letter. Uh, the same system described. Rex from Texas. Revelation 21.8 condemns a liar. Yet in Genesis 22, Abraham lies about his wife. Aren't there certain occasions that require a lie? Oop, 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 Rex. Abraham didn't lie. Sarai was his half-sister. She was his sister also. So that's kind of using a little deception or covert activity is quite all right at times, but not lie necessarily. Covert activity. Um, Jacob used covert activity at the request of God. John from California, Revelation 14, 3, who are the four living creatures? The Zun, or the Zun, are the four creatures that God has guarding the throne of the Almighty God, placed there, I'm sure, after Satan fell, that supernatural entities could uh, attempt a struggle. Okay, Beth from Michigan. One question, my E.J. Goodspeed Apocrypha does not have a chapter 7, verse 77 in the second book of Esdras. Now I know I'm, just, just keep going in it. You'll find it, all right? It's, it is separated, but it is there also, all right? I'm, I'm sorry if I had one here, I'd turn there quickly for you and tell you what page. Oh, dear, should I say 391? Uh, that number pops in my mind, but I, 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 I don't know. You, you look. Don't, don't stop there. Keep looking further on in 2nd Esdras. You'll find it. Okay. Hey, we're out of time again. I love you all so much. Know why you enjoy studying our Father's Word. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. You know what? If God blesses you from His Word, bless Him in return, and He'll always bless your life. Because he loves you. Let him know that you love him. So inasmuch as we are brought to you with your tithes and offerings, if we have helped you, help us keep coming your way. Won't you do that? Most of all, this is important. Stay in his word every day and it's a beautiful day. Do you know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.